Hey, Coach Randy here. It is with a heavy heart that I open this week's show. Two days after we recorded the action you'll see on this episode of Prodigy, on Monday, President's Day 2019, my dog died. Or to be more specific, I had to put her down. She was a rescue, so it was never certain exactly when she was born. But on the day I got her, December 7th, 2002, the rescue group that I got her from estimated that she was about 10 months old at the time. So I sort of unofficially declared her birth date to be March 11th, 2002, the day I had to put my last dog, Chewbacca, a Lhasa Apso, down. He almost made it to 16. My dear sweet Mulligan almost made it to her unofficial 17th birthday when I let her go last Monday. Mulligan and I went through a lot together in the 16 years we spent together. I was there for her the night she got attacked at the dog park by a big mean dog who left her with a permanent Evander Holyfield-style chunk missing from her ear. And she was there for me in the aftermath of the five surgeries I had from 2009 through 2011. Each time when I got home from the hospital, she would lay by my side, lording over me like a mother hen never letting me out of her sight. We were inseparable, and never was there a human and a dog closer than we were with each other. She was my shadow, and for as long as she could go with me, she went everywhere I went. This past year, and especially these past several months, had been increasingly difficult, watching her deteriorate. Her vision was gone, her hearing suspect, she was wobbly on her feet and in the final weeks had become pretty emaciated and stopped eating altogether in the final days. It was just so sad. I'm not gonna lie, I got pretty mad at God for what he did to her. So I suppose in more ways than I really want to admit, as hard as it was to let her go, the final act was more of a relief than anything else, at least as I know her suffering and her confusion are over and she's at peace. I didn't even think about starting work on putting this week's prodigy together until I knew I could keep from sobbing long enough to work on the show. I'm a world-class crier, and the tears have come with convulsions, and to be honest, they're not done coming yet. Before the worst of it subsides, I imagine I'll probably end up with bruised ribs I've been crying so hard and so uncontrollably. So I appreciate your understanding and your patience. There's a good chance I won't be going to the bowl on the weekend of February 23rd to tape a new episode of Prodigy, but hopefully I'll feel up to it again on March 2nd. And today's show may take on a somewhat different feel just because my mind, quite frankly, is somewhere else. But the kids who came to bowl on the show on February 16th deserve my best effort to get this show out, so I hope you'll join me in cheering them on. And if you've got a dog or cat at home, give them a hug for me. Today on Prodigy Bowlers Tour. With most of our league's A players away at the final Georgia Interstate All-Stars Tournament at Brunswick Zone Lilburn against the Interstate All-Stars teams from North and South Carolina, we were left with the smallest field of the year. With such a small field and a wide spread of averages among our players, we decided to bowl one of our rare all-handicap events today. All five players who began made the show. So let's meet them. Qualifying in the fifth position is Jake Bowling. A former winner on Prodigy, he's looking for a return trip to the winner's circle. He'll face our fourth-ranked player, making just his second appearance on Prodigy Bowlers Tour and the first in almost two years, Nick Gilbert. Nick is one of eight players in our Roswell Varsity League with a 200-plus average. The winner of that opening match will face our third-place qualifier, Nolan Kemp, a regular on Prodigy. Bowling Nolan has won several times in team events, but is still searching for his first singles win on Prodigy. The winner of that match will face our number two qualifier, Nick Dissinger. If the Georgia All-Stars knew of him, he'd be on their team and wouldn't be with us today. 
I guess he was one of the best kept secrets in the state of Georgia going into this season. But after his frequent appearances on Prodigy Bowlers Tour this year, his secret is out. And the winner of that semifinal match will bowl for the title today against our tournament leader, Hunter Moffitt. That's right, Hunter took the highest handicap among the five players and dropped a cool little 220 scratch on them in the second game of qualifying to jettison to the top of the leaderboard. So today, the road to the coveted trophy pin goes through Hunter. Celebrating junior bowling, elevating junior bowlers, this is Prodigy Bowlers Tour. Live on tape from the newly renovated Brunswick Zone Roswell in Roswell, Georgia. This is Coach Randy, welcoming you to episode 86 of Prodigy Bowlers Tour, Soul Bowl 2019. And that title should give you a good clue of what pattern we're bowling on today. It's the world bowling pattern known as Soul. 39 feet in length, so it'll play a little on the short side, with a ratio of about 2.5 to 1, and an overall volume of 25.1 milliliters of oil. The rule of 31 dictates that you'll want your ball on around the eighth board as it comes off the end of the pattern at the 39 foot mark. But the players were all over the lane in qualifying, and I expect that to continue in the stepladder matches. Here's a look at how qualifying unfolded. I set the handicap today at 90% of the difference between their current league average and 220. So even Nick, the highest average player in the field, got a few pins handicapped. And after a solid 242 scratch to start the day, Nick took the early lead. But when Hunter uncorked that 220 scratch game in game two, he leapfrogged past Nick to the number one position in the field. So let's wait no more. We've got two players who are infrequent visitors to Prodigy in our opening match, as number five seed Jake Bowling takes on our number four seed Nick Gilbert. Now Jake is getting 37 pins in handicap, while Nick gets just 18. That's a difference of 19 pins, so we'll be adding that 19-pin handicap differential into Jake's score in the first frame, so you won't have to add it in for yourself. Nick, being the higher finisher, had the choice of starting lanes, and he has elected to let Jake start the match. And Jake starts it with a bang. A solid strike to begin. Watch this two-hander. As he sneaks up on the foul line, lets it go over about 17 at the arrows, out to about seven at the break point. And right back in the pocket. That is a good way to start. Build a little confidence from the get-go. And now Nick Gilbert. First time you saw him on Prodigy, he actually wasn't on the show. He was practicing on the lanes next to us. Everybody said, who's that guy? Well, he's this guy. And he starts with a crossover strike. One of the higher rev rates we have in the league. He is one of eight players in the Roswell Varsity League with an average north of 200. That one gets out to about four at the break point and crosses over. Little grabby at the bottom that time. It's what caused the ball to overreact. But that was a perfect strike right there. And Nick gets a double right out of the gate and cuts that 19-pin handicap differential down to nine, just like that. Watch this. Can't do it any better than that. All right, Jake, a chance to get those 10 pins back. 
And he does it. So these two, each starting with doubles. And we'll see Jake's shot. Stuck at the line a little bit. But it goes through the pins as he had hoped. And that's a solid strike. You notice he starts with his heels up by the front row of dots. Very short approach. This time the ball goes high. And he leaves the 3, 6, 9, 10. This is a tricky one. You can miss this many different ways. You want to hit high enough on the three pin that you get the nine, but not so high that you chop it off the six. And that's not what you want. You got to hit the pin in front on all spares. But this time, that ball slides by and we have our first open of the match. And suddenly, this is a three pin match. Nick, not only a good bowler, but thought to have potentially a big league arm. He's been really active in baseball the last few years. Hoping to develop his talent on that side. He's been taking this year off, though. All the body English in the world just won't get the 6 and 10 to go. So he will go cross lane at the spare. And he covers it. Now this young man, not only is he a fine baseball player, pitcher, but he's also a pilot. I didn't know they let kids pilot planes, but he can do it. goodness I thought that ball was gone he sent that one way to the right but it got back enough to tick the head pin and watch this head pins gonna go to the left wall and it knocks the four forward into the two He knows he got away with murder. All right, Jake up on the right lane. And he gets a crossover. Trips the six. The characteristic of 39 and 40 is that lane 40 usually hooks about three to five boards more than lane 39. I think he just pulled that one. It didn't get as wide as some of the others he's thrown, but he got away with it. But that time he tries to correct for it and overcorrects and sent that one into Never Never Land. The good news is he was on a strike. Not a double, just one strike. So he doesn't lose any count. So it's as good as nine if he can make the spare. But that is nine out. 
And that's two opens in a row for Jake on the left lane. Fortunately, he doesn't have to finish on the left lane. But Nick takes the lead, sitting on the bench. And with a strike working, he can extend the lead to 17 if he can get them all to go right here. He's a fidgety guy, isn't he? Looks like a pitcher up on the mound going through all his little mannerisms. And that one goes high once again, and he leaves the 6-10, just as he did in the third frame. Watch this. See where this ball goes. Well, looky here. His right shoulder outraced his left shoulder. See how his left arm is behind his shoulders? You get your right shoulder, you get your bowling shoulder in front of your non-bowling shoulder, and you're going to pull it every time. That's what happened on that shot. Ooh! And an unforced error there. That one well wide of the mark, and an open frame, and he hands the lead right back to Jake. So when that happens, you just try to forget about it. Never adjust off a bad shot. Just forget about it and try to make a good one. I'd say he made a good one. That's about as good as they get right there. Had to like that one. So now Jake on lane 40. He's struck on this lane each time he's been up on it so far this match. And he gets another one. It goes a little high, but he tripped the four. And when you get through the ball well, that's the reward. You'll get some trip fours. You'll get some light shakers to go. Just gets the four from behind. Well, the left lane is the one he's been having trouble with. He's opened each of the last two times he's been up. This time, a relatively easy spare, the 6-10. He moves to the left. He's got his plastic ball. This is his spare ball. And it slides by. And another open on the left lane. So once again, Nick takes the lead sitting on the bench. And these two just can't seem to shake one another. Whoever gets ahead has a chance to extend with a strike up and then can't seem to get it done. Well, Nick now with another opportunity. If he can unlock the mystery of lane 40 here and catch a double. But high again. He left the 6-10 in the third, the 6-10 in the fifth, and now the 3-6-9, very similar to the 3-6-9-10 we saw earlier. Shoot it pretty much the same way. Put the ball pretty flush on the three pin. You want to have it a little off center so that you can get the six. But you got to be careful with this.
And he throws another one in the moat. Well, you might be able to get away with that on the house shot. But not on soul. So, once again. He hands the lead right back to Jake. But this time, seven out on a strike. That costs him six pins in count. And this time he gets up on the left lane and doesn't recover with a strike. Goes high again and leaves the 3-6. And he better make a better shot at this than he did at the 3-6-9 on lane 40 or he's going to fall way behind. Goes with a different ball and covers it. That was a nice shot. Looked like he flattened his wrist to try to throw it straighter. But now Jake with a big gift and an 11-pin lead late in the match. And a strike on the right lane. He has struck every time so far on the right lane, and that's the lane he'll finish on. Out to about eight at the break point, and crunch. But now, what's he gonna do on this left lane? Well, it didn't go high. The last three. Well, I guess he threw that one in the moat earlier. That wasn't high. But the one, two, four. You just gotta move your feet about four or five boards to the right. Get that ball to go Brooklyn. Throw it right over your strike target. Throw your strike ball over your strike target. Just start about three or four boards to the right with your feet. Oh, it overhooks. And another open on the left lane. That's four in a row. Well, the good news for Jake is he's done with the left lane this game. The bad news is Nick is up in the ninth with a one-pin lead with a chance to shut Jake out. Lots of fidgeting. A little rocking back and forth. Oh, that was a pretty good ball right there. But now we've got a match that is all tied up. Assuming Nick can convert the four pin. Carefully placing his feet. And he takes care of the spare, so... It's gonna come down to who can perform in the 10th. If they both strike out, they tie. Slight advantage to Jake because Nick has a spare up, so if he doesn't strike here, he loses a little count. It would behoove Nick to at least strike on the first ball in the 10. Take care of that count issue.
Oh, he threw a good one. Ring and ten. Well, I bet if you told him you could throw it again, he'd probably want to throw it just like that. Watch this. Watch the six pin, the second one from the right. It's going to fly right around the neck of the ten pin. Not much you can do about that. Other than gnash your teeth a little bit. Now he's got to make this. Put some pressure on Jake. All right. Last couple of spares he had over on the right side of the lane were a little iffy, so... That was an important one. Now, if he strikes here, he'll shoot 176, and that will at least force Jake to get a strike in the 10th, either on the first ball or on the fill ball, to beat him. Count is super important here. Seven. Not what he wanted. That's 173, so it comes down to this. Jake Bowling needs to fill 17 pins in the 10th to win. He can do it spare seven or strike seven. Doesn't matter, but he must mark. And there is no better way to mark than to put one right there, solid in the pocket, and get them all. Man, that was a pressure shot right there. When you need a mark, just go right there. All right, he's got two shots now to get seven pins. I think he can handle it. And there's all ten. And that is the shutout ball. Watch it again. He just sneaks up on the foul line, don't he? Just ticks the head pin, and it comes back off the wall and gets the two from the side. He's a happy boy. One eighty-six with the handicap differential added in, so it's Jake Bowling who's moving on to match two where he will bowl. Bowl and Nolan Kemp next. Hey, it's me, Coach Randy, with exciting news about a new way you can help support Prodigy Bowlers Tour. Over the past couple of years, we've had a number of Prodigy fans say they'd love to offer something in payment for the Prodigy content seen each week on YouTube throughout the bowling season. Well, I'm pleased to announce that Prodigy is now on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash Prodigy Bowlers Tour. Now, in case you're not familiar with it, Patreon is a platform where YouTube content consumers like you can connect directly with YouTube content creators like me and pledge a small amount of money each month to support the work that goes into creating the content that you enjoy watching. It's based on the age-old concept of patrons. About 30 to 40 hours of work goes into the production of each and every episode of Prodigy Bowlers Tour. So if you enjoy the content on Prodigy Bowlers Tour each week and you'd like to support the show, please check it out at patreon.com slash prodigybowlerstour.
There are four affordable subscription tiers, and each one offers a different reward, up to and including sneak peeks of shows before they're released to the public, exclusive behind-the-scenes content that only members will ever see, and there's even a tier that will enable you to get all that and get your name in the credits each week as a producer of the show. You'll be helping me to be able to continue making the show each week and even reinvest some of the money into improving the show going forward. Thanks for checking it out, and thanks for supporting Prodigy Bowlers Tour. Well, match one could easily have gone either way. Both players left enough pins on the table for their opponent to sneak through. But in the critical 10th frame, Nick couldn't get the 10 to go, and Jake was able to dig deep and throw a double when it mattered most. So it's Jake Bowling who's moving on to match two, where he'll face our number three seed, Bolin Nolan Kemp. Now, in terms of handicap this match, things will be much closer. Jake is receiving 37 pins in handicap, while Nolan gets 30. That's a differential of just seven pins. We'll add those seven pins into Jake's score in the first frame, so you won't have to add it in your head. The score you see on screen will reflect the handicap differential being included. And once again, Nolan being the higher finisher through qualifying, he had the choice of starting lanes. And he wants to finish first, so He's going to let Jake lead off on the left lane. Good yeah, boy. Well. Not sure exactly what happened there, but covered a lot of boards. Obviously not the shot he had hoped to hit, but didn't lose any count. Not on a spare, not on a double. So pick up the spare. It's as good as nine spare. Just like that. Well, that'll get your adrenaline going anyway as if Jake were at any risk of nodding off. Somehow I doubt it. Good shot, good recovery. Nolan loosening up with that 14 pound roto grip ball of his, the hypercell fused. And right in the pocket. How do you like that? I think he liked it. That familiar crooked arm style. It's actually going to be an interesting contrast between these two. They both have a crooked arm style. One of them one-handed, one of them two-handed. Nolan got the headphones in today. I think he wants to stay in his own world. Comes up a little thin on lane 39. We've talked about this before. The left lane on this pair doesn't hook quite as much as the right lane. You have to compensate for that. The two, four, five, eight, we call it the bucket or the dinner bucket. Put the ball on the two and the five. Let the ball drive through and carry out the back pin, the sleeper eight. I usually like to see a spare ball, except when you have double wood like this. Whenever you've got a sleeper, I like the strike ball choice. And that's why. If he'd been throwing plastic, I'm not sure he would have gotten the eight. 
He just barely got it as it is, and I'm not sure that it was the ball that got it. I think he actually got that off the wall. Watch it again. Watch the two pin. It may go to the wall. Now, I think actually the four pin got it. It fell to the right, so I'm pretty sure it wasn't the ball that knocked it over. All right, Jake, up on lane 40. Ooh, that was a good shot. Not rewarded. Ring and 10, you see that we've added the seven pin handicap differential into his score in the first frame. Spare and nine doesn't usually give you 26 in the first frame, but that's because we've added in the seven pins. Oh. And he says, now it hooks. Well, that's because in that last match, you recall he used that ball shooting at the 610, and the ball slid by, left the six, but took out the 10. But again, even with a plastic ball, that right lane gonna hook a little more than the left lane on this pair. He's got that lane down. So a strike in the third, and Nolan with a five-pin lead. See the crooked elbow style of Jake Bowling. I would like to see him get that elbow in a little bit. It points out so he doesn't have his arm fully behind the ball. And so his throw is more of a piston-like, like he's shoving the ball forward from elbow to hand. No one has a crooked elbow, but it's a little different. He's not shoving it, he's swinging it. Oh man, what a break! The 6 7 10 was standing, then the 7 10 was standing. Watch this. The ball's going to cut right through the heart. And I think the 3 pin, no, it's the 2 pin that comes back across the lane and takes out the 6 and 10. How about that messenger? See him take advantage of that break. He does. He covers the seven and maintains a four-pin lead. Now remember, Jake started the match with a seven-pin handicap differential, so the match has swung 11 pins in Nolan's favor. That's that nine and open in the second frame for Jake that caused that 11-pin swing. And now Nolan backing off. The players over on 35 and 36 are warming up. Man, that was a good ball right there. The swish and seven. When we talk about hitting in the swish zone, it's that half pocket. Watch this. It'll be the five pin, the one in the middle of the rack. The ball will just deflect enough that it slides the five in front of the seven instead of driving on through, catching a little more of it and sending it into the seven. This is what we call the swish and seven. And he covers the seven again after leaving it on the right lane just a moment earlier. So Nolan clean through four frames. Now Jake working on a strike with a chance here to take the lead if he can get another strike. But no, that one cuts through the nose. 
And now he's got the 310 baby split. And here's how you make it. And as I've pointed out before, the farther left you stand, the better the angle to make this. And here's why. See how the farther to the right you move, the space or gap between the three and the 10 gets wider and wider. So you have a much better angle to make this if you stand at the left. He's kind of playing this down the right side of the lane. But when you place it in the perfect spot, it won't matter. It's just that when you play it from the left side of the lane, you've got a little more margin for error. But a perfect shot is a perfect shot is a perfect shot. And that was a perfect shot. Good going, Jake. Keeps the match close. And that strike surely helps him out. So, it's back in Nolan's hand. We watch this strike that Jake just got on lane 39. Over about 16 at the arrows, out to about five at the break point. And right through the pocket. Nolan's been steady this game. Only one errant shot when he left the bucket. Nothing wrong with that one, though. That's as solid a strike as you'll see. Four-step approach. Plays down and in. Keeping the angles in front of him. And 10 in the pit. You see him wipe that ball down. That's part of his pre-shot routine. He'll do it every time. just a little wide of the mark. You don't have the recovery out to the right on this pattern that you would on a house shot, so the ball sails on him. Still, you get nine out of that. You gotta be happy about it. Leaves the easiest spare there is, the five pin. Just throw your strike ball. Nothing to it. But now, a squandered opportunity to stack two strikes together. So, advantage Jake, who now has a strike working. So he'll have a chance to take the lead. If he can put a double up on the board. But no, a high hit. Six ten. He'll go with his plastic ball at this. And he converts the spare. So we still have a three-pin match. I like it when they stay close. Yeah, you could tell that was left right off his hand. One of the problems that Jake will have sometimes is pulling the ball left. 
And when you get your elbow out to the right, it puts your hand on the outside of the ball, and especially if you're gonna use that piston-type motion and get your hand on the outside of the ball, you're gonna tend to throw it left of your target. Oh, look at this. He missed to the right. And once again, that plastic ball sails on him on the left lane, but it's hooking a little bit on the right lane, and he can't seem to quite calibrate it. That's twice now. He's missed an easy spear on the right, on the left lane, with that plastic ball. So, Nolan. The lead, now 15. If he can just stay steady. I haven't seen him this deliberate in a while. He's going to back off. May have been the players over on 35 and 36 that disturbed him, but that's four lanes away. High hit, nearly crossed over. Leaves an easy spare, the six pin. So he'll go with this other ball. It doesn't hook as much. And he covers the spare. So he maintains that 14 pin lead as now we're getting late in the match. When you're nursing a lead like this, there's no place safe to go. Just go to the pocket. He's really taking his time. And he doesn't like the rack. The rack looks fine to me. If he had a narrow pocket, I'd be all for re-racking, but that rack looks perfect. But you know what? Sometimes you take a re-rack just because you want to take a little 30-second time out. Just to collect your thoughts. Sometimes that can work against you, though. You think about it a little too much. Well, I don't know if the timeout is the cause of that, but watch his reaction to it. I think it surprised him. He liked it when it came off his hand. He looked surprised. But it's the 6 7 10. It can be made. We haven't seen this converted on Prodigy in quite a while. Got to put the ball way over on the right side of the six pin, slide it over. Nope, too full on the six pin, so an open frame, and this match is dead even. Well, somebody's going to have to step up here at the end. Who will it be? Oh my goodness. Jake gets the six and the 10 to go. 
as the three pin whistles around them. Watch this. Man, it just barely ticked him on the way around. But that's a strike, and now a chance to take the lead with a double. And he trips the four to move out ahead by 10. That's huge. And puts all the pressure on Nolan. This looked left off his hand. But that two pin goes between the four and seven and trips them both out. All right, Nolan, it's time to get busy. Oh, and he goes through the nose again. And this is real trouble, the 4-6. This one is rarely made. Two schools of thought on it. Usually you just throw hard at one of them and try to bounce it out. That doesn't happen all that often. You can tilt one over into the other, but you've got to cut it so thin that you're more often going to get eight out than you are to tip it over into the other one. He takes the count. And that is back-to-back -back opens, and the lead is now 21. Well, let's do the math here. Nolan can strike out for 182. That would force Jake to get a mark in the 10th. So Nolan pretty much is in a must-strike situation. Oh boy. And now that is bad news. The 2-4-10, you can make it. Get the ball over to the left side of the two, throw it into the 10. The ball will get the four. He can shoot 172 if he makes it in strikes. But with an open, that's 161. And Jake just has to keep the ball on the lane. He needs five pins on the first ball. Five pins on the first ball, and he can move on to match three. And there's all ten. So see you later. And I know this one's a tough one for Nolan. He bowled well today for seven frames. That's how you steamroll them over right there. Possible 213. And the Shaker 7 won't go, so he's going to be 202 with a conversion. That's with his seven pin handicap differential added in there it is 202 or scratch 195 either way it's good enough to move on it's gonna be Jake Bowling and the unibowler Nick Dissinger in match three when we return Ronald McDonald in bowling for burgers we still have a chance Bertie Go for it! Stand back, boys! It looks like a strike! And you're out! <laughs> okay, I'll throw a spare! I think you got it, Grimace! Oh, think yeah. again! You're our last hope, Ronald! Watch this! Boom! Oh! Oh! Will you believe in magic? 
good game, you guys. Thanks. We, we always, always fall, fall for that, that one. <laughs> <laughs>well i feel for nolan i know how badly he wants to win one of these things he's managed to win a few times in team events but never a singles crown and he was going along so well through the first seven frames only to leave three splits and endure three open frames to close the match but his day will come in the meantime that's two wins in a row and now jake bowling is on a roll Next up is match three, where his opponent is the winningest player on Prodigy Bowlers Tour this season, Nick Dissinger, who told me he's got to leave to get to his job on time as a manager at one of the area McDonald's. So if you want your Big Macs hot today, we need to get Nick out of here. Oh, as for the handicaps this match, believe it or not, Nick actually gets a few pins handicap. He gets six. But Jake gets 37. That's a 31 pin differential. So we'll add those 31 pins into Jake's score in the first frame. So you won't have to add a thing. Nick has chosen to let Jake open the match. So here we go. Oh man. He opened the last match with a gutter ball and still won, but I don't know if that just comes from sitting idly by while your opponent is throwing his warm-up shot, but here's the one, two, three, five, seven. You shoot it just like a strike. Well, not just like he shot at the last strike. Put it in the one, three pocket this time, Jake, and you'll make this. Oh, but he comes in light and leaves the 2-5, and that's eight out. So as you can see, we've added his 31 pins handicap differential to his score, 31 plus eight. That gives him 39 in the first. Now Nick. And he goes high, and... Nearly had a cluster and then nearly had the 310 and broke it all down to a simple spare, just the three pin. What? You don't see Nick do that very often with the three pin. So he had a chance to uh, shave about 11 pins off the lead early on but not to be he just picks up one pin but throws a beautiful strike in the second frame and as you can see he's playing just straight up about well let's take a look here I'm thinking he hit about seven at the arrows yeah six or seven out to about four at the break point Good ball. And a high hit from Jake. And he leaves the three pin. Well, we saw how Nick shot at the three pin. Now, is Jake going to throw his spare ball? Nope. I think this is urethane he's throwing. And he covers the simple spare. And moves over to lane 39. Well, we set the number high enough that even Nick got some pins and handicap. It was 90% of their the difference between their league average and 220. How about that little down and in shot? Throwing his urethane ball in the left lane. Perhaps a change in strategy by Jake? Who knows?
Good shot. Gets that 10 to fall inward. And Nick playing a similar line on the right lane to the one he was playing on the left lane, but he ought to know by now that the right lane, lane 40, almost always hooks more than the left lane. And he nearly missed the three pin again. This time on the other side, he went with his plastic ball that time. Actually, I think he threw his plastic ball at it the first time, missed it on the left. Well, I think he'd rather just bowl on the left lane. Two strikes on the left lane, two three pins on the right lane, a miss and a make. Smooth six step delivery. And a little trippy, trippy four. Watch his reaction. He won't usually give you much. There you go. All right, Jake, strike up. He got that one way out wide and brought it back. And that double extends his lead to 40. Watch this. Throwing his urethane. That's a pitch black. God, he got that out to about three. And shook him up. We'll see his reaction. Jake's a pretty cool customer. He won't show you much reaction usually. A little wry smile. He may think he got away with one there, but that's a good hit. You hit them light, they're gonna go. Can't hit them that light, though. Nowadays, with the modern equipment, especially the reactive resin balls, now he's not throwing reactive right now, but when you are, those light hits will quite often carry. And he covers the two. So Nick better figure out this right lane or it's going to be a quick in and out for him. Oh man, he almost had the 4-9. Nine. nine goes out, but he just can't seem to string them. Three high hits on the right lane for Nick. A couple of three pins and now a four in. Look at this. Well, he told me he wasn't sure he would even be able to stay for the championship match, even if he won this game. Because he's got to scoot and get over to his job at McDonald's. And he looks like he's hurrying a bit. And that is not usually conducive to good bowling. Here's the 3-6-10. Go cross lane at it, and you'll reduce the chances of chopping. He gets it on the inside, and that's not how we draw it up, but it's a spare nonetheless. Jake in the driver's seat with a 51 pin lead. Boom. Put another one of those up and it's going to be a real quick exit for Nick. Watch this one. Ten in the pit. Hello. 
on this guy. And Jake is just cracking the whip today. Tell you the one thing about Jake's game that I really like is he gets real low at the line. Well, Nick looked away that time. I'm not sure if it's because he liked it or because he didn't like it, but I'm sure he doesn't like it now. Soft 10. And he misses it. Two. Unbelievable. Well, let's see here. Nick can strike out for 195. Jake just kind of needs to show up. Well, there's a shot with a reactive resin ball. He just, look, he moved up. Watch this. He moves way up, takes five steps. To slow his feet down. Very versatile player. Not everybody can switch in mid-game like that. Jake breaks down the 6'10 and leaves just the 6. He'll go cross lane at it. Shouldn't have any problem with this. And doesn't. Jake going at a 237 pace. More importantly, he just needs to get to 196 to shut out Nick. And he can do that on this next ball. And that, I believe, will do it. Not the kind of performance we would ever expect to see out of Nick Dissinger, but I think his mind was on quarter pounders. Oh, look out. That actually touched the two pin. It just wiggled a little bit as the ball just grazed the edge of it, but it doesn't matter. He's already got this game locked up. Well, Nick said that uh, if he had to leave, he'd just let us know and then Jake could just bowl the championship match as an alternate if he couldn't stay and bowl. So Jake was probably going to be bowling in the next match either way. But at least this way, he earned his way in. And Nick just monkeying around now, I think. Maybe he's trying to see how many balls he can throw in one game. Let's see, he's thrown his reactive. He's thrown his pitch black. That was his idol. I kind of halfway expected him to bring another ball. Oh, I think he threw his physics this game, too. Oh, that may have been his reactive. I think that's what this is. And it cuts through sharply, and he leaves the... Super washout. The one, two, four, six, ten. 
Well, you can make this a couple of different ways. How's he going to go at it? He's going to go at it the right way. Well, one of the right ways. We'll take another look at that one. He goes for the right side of the head pin. He does it the right way from the left side of the lane, throwing straight at it, so the ball deflects over into the six. Watch it again. Well, that's not his best shot there. But somehow he gets nine out of it. It's gonna be a 152 for Nick and he can't get his shoes off fast enough. And he'll be in Woodstock before you know it. All right, Jake. Possible 235. Mm, but instead, he cuts through the heart of the pins, and now he's got the four, seven, ten. Just go for the left side of the four. I think he's probably just going to throw it anywhere. Well, don't throw it there. I don't know what that was. He gives a field goal gesture, and they shake hands, and... Uh, well, Jake is moving on. He's in the championship match. He'll face Hunter Moffat next. Now, bring the spirit of Prodigy Bowlers Tour to your bowling center with Prodigy Bowlers Tour t-shirts and sportswear, including collared shirts with the Prodigy logo printed on the back to show that you support junior bowling. Check out the entire assortment of Prodigy t-shirts in the Brownswick store. Visit ProdigyBowlersTour.com to see the selection. See the Ash Gray Celebrating Junior Bowling Elevating Junior Bowlers t-shirt. Or the Who Will Win the Coveted Trophy Pin t-shirt. Or maybe you'd want the one that says, I've come to get my bowl on, right on the front of the shirt. Or simply, Bowl Me. There's a t-shirt that says, Bowling. You probably don't get it because it's mainly for smart people. And if you're a proud parent with a junior bowler, we've got a t-shirt just for you. And how about this t-shirt? You're bowling an eighth grader. Prepare to meet defeat. Available in grades one through nine, most in both adult and kid sizes. And finally, the shirt that reads, bowl better, have more fun, take lessons. Then maybe you can keep up with me. The Brownswick store is powered by the people at Cafe Press, and all of these shirts are available right now. Just go to prodigybowlerstour.com and click on the link to be taken right to the store. PayPal and credit cards accepted. That's prodigybowlerstour.com. Get your bowl on and bring the spirit of Prodigy Bowlers Tour to your house. Order now. Go to prodigybowlerstour.com. That's prodigybowlerstour.com. Rise up! Can't say for sure, but it sure looked to me like Nick had his mind on skedaddling out the door and getting to his job at Mickey D's on time. His heart just never seemed to be in it that last game. Or maybe it was, and Jake just put an old-fashioned beat down on him. Whatever the reason, Jake Bowling cruised to an easy win that was decided early. So now Jake is moving on to the championship match where he'll face Hunter Moffat. So the two players with the highest handicaps in the field make it to the end. And now they'll square off for the right to sign the coveted trophy pin. Now, as for the handicaps, this time the tables are turned on Jake as he'll be spotting Hunter some pins. Hunter's handicap is 54 while Jake's is 37. That's a 17 pin differential. So we'll add 17 pins into Hunter's score in the first frame. So the scores you see on screen will include the handicap differential. It'll already be added in. And Hunter, the higher qualifier, changing things up. He wants to start the match. 
Comes in a little thin. Leaves the 2-5. Hunter starting out with his urethane ball. That's a pitch black. Now, if you look real closely, Hunter sometimes uses his pinky and his ring finger in the ball. He injured his middle finger. Oh gosh, it's been months ago now. And he's never quite gotten comfortable throwing with his middle and ring fingers. Even though I'm sure that finger is all healed up now. All right, Jake. Goes high and leaves the 6-10. Looks like he also starting out with urethane this match. He will move to the extreme left side and go cross lane at the 6-10. And that ball that hooks a little bit hooks just enough to chop the six right off the ten. I'm kind of surprised he didn't throw his white plastic ball at that spare. I think he lost confidence in it because it went by on a couple of spares, but that was on the left lane. Anyway, he's down 28. Oh my goodness, that's three times he's done that today. And he's thrown a couple out into the weeds, so that's something he may want to look at this tape and figure out what's going on. Part of it is that he gets his hips turned so far open that sometimes he just never gets them squared back up. And that ball just hits flat and doesn't drive through and leaves the 5-7, so a disastrous open in the second, piled on top of an unforced error in the first frame, and Hunter has a 40-pin lead before he ever throws a ball in the second frame. And he puts that one right in the pocket, but it doesn't quite face up the way he needed it to, to snap out the 10. And he's checking something with the approach. Don't know if he slipped or if he stuck, but one thing we've been working with Hunter on is sticking the landing. And he goes with a one-handed delivery with his plastic ball at the 10 and misses it on the left. He's been having some difficulty with the 10 pin lately, which is a little out of character for him. He's been a pretty good little spare shooter. That time he just missed to the right and leaves a cluster. The 128 can be tricky at times. The best way to play it is a little left of center of the head pin. Let the ball take out the one on the two. The two should get the eight. Or if you hit it just right, the ball can get all three. That's the best way to shoot it. And that's exactly what Hunter did. You want to make sure and convert the 128. Throw it right like this and let the ball take out all three pins. Just like that. Well done. 
All right, Jake, trailing by 28. Needs to stop the bleeding. There you go. Good shot. Looks like he made a slight adjustment with his feet. Takes a big step to the left. With his left foot, that's a little unusual. You see some two-handers do it. But not often that much. And this time he misses the head pin on the right, so... I don't know if that was an overcorrection or if he just missed what he was looking at, but he's got the washout, the one, two, four, ten. Move your feet seven boards to the right and throw your strike ball over your strike target at the arrows. And you should make the one, two, four, ten. But he gets too much of the head pin. And that's another open. Jake needs to hit the pause button. Regroup. And Hunter comes in thin, and look at this. We could see this match tighten in a hurry. He's got the 210. Shoot this about like you shoot a four pin. Just put the ball over where you'd hit at the four pin and slide the two over into the 10. Sounds easy. It is easy. And judging from Hunter's face, I'd say he was a little surprised at that. But he did this perfectly. Watch this ball. It's going to hook and catch the left side of the two. Throw it right into the 10. Well done. Watch his reaction. <laughs> yeah, I believe that surprised even Hunter. Well, now he's just making things difficult on himself. One of the many flavors of the Super Washout, this time the 1, 2, 6, 10. We saw Nick make this with the 4-pin earlier by throwing it from the left side at the right side of the head pin. Like this, it can be made on either side of the head pin. Let's see which way Hunter opts to shoot at this. Going with his plastic ball, he's probably throwing it the right side. And he gets it! He's a trick shot artist. Watch this. He's in pretty good balance when he lets it go. That's key. Not only does that help you maintain leverage on strike shots, but it helps you maintain accuracy. How about that? Back-to-back -back difficult spares, and Hunter picks them both. That keeps his lead intact. Oh, boy. And you know what? When your opponent is leaving stuff like that and making it, it feels like a dagger through your heart. And now Jake's got the next to impossible 4 6 10. Just go for two. About all you can do with that. But now Jake has four opens in five frames and has dug himself quite a hole. But the good news is he's got half the game left. And we've seen him string strikes before. He's going to another ball. Oh, no. 
He expected that reactive resin ball to react more than it did, but it kind of hung out there. And the 2-8-10, he broke it down to the 8-10. He wouldn't have had much better luck if the two had stayed up. But that's another open. Goodness gracious. And Hunter, with clear sailing ahead, if he can just stay clean. As I was saying about staying clean, suddenly Hunter leaves the granddaddy of all the splits, the 7-10. Now, if he makes this, I'll really be impressed. There's not much you can do with this but just throw hard and try to kick one out of the back. That's about as hard as Hunter can throw it. saw one of the PBA players just a week or so ago actually slide the 10 over into the 7. I had never seen that. I didn't think it was possible. But apparently it can be done once in a lifetime, maybe. Well, now, Hunter... Threatening to leave another split, going through the nose. This time he leaves the 6-10. And converts it. So it's uh, pretty much up to Jake to strike out. Let's see, he can go... 183 if he strikes out. Hunter is going at a 186 pace right now, so anything is possible, but Jake's got to string him now. And you're not going to start stringing him missing the head pin to the left. The 139, you don't want to hit it exactly in the pocket. You want to hit it in the light pocket. So that three pin will go straight back into the nine. And that's a little too wide. And, well, Mama said there'd be days like this. He bowled well for three games. Yeah. Five games, counting the qualifying. But now he's in trouble. Possible 162. There you go. That time he gets enough of a pocket to mix him up with that reactive ball. So he's mathematically still in it. get that one quite as wide and he was throwing the reactive ball that had a little more oomph on the back end he's probably thinking to himself why didn't I switch to that ball sooner and I'd say that's a good question Hunter in the pocket once again leaves the 10 now he missed this earlier. But again, he can go open, open, open and still end up in the 150s. But this time he covers the 10 pin. And that was big. He probably only needs one more mark. And that would just about seal it. And how about a shaker?
Well, that means he's got 155 if he doesn't knock down another pin. Watch this. The head pin's going to go to the left wall. And actually, he gets caught in the gutter. That was a blower. That ball ticked the five pin. The five pin went over there and took out the four. How about that? Little guy's got some power. 11 years old. Jake must strike. And that's a four pin, and that's going to do it. Hunter has won the Soul Bowl 2019. He's won a few times when we had a handicap division or a littles division. As Jake runs by the four pin, doesn't really matter now. But the last time Hunter won the main event that we staged on Prodigy was, I believe, October 2017. In the long and winding road. And Jake now all of a sudden just can't get the seven to go. But he just ran out of strikes this last game. He bowled well all day. He gets the spare in the tenth, so he'll have 120 if he can finish with a strike. But 120 in the championship match? When you're spotting your opponent 17 pins, Probably not going to get it done. There's a strike to finish. So at least he goes out on a positive note. Hunter shakes his hand, and now Hunter will go through the motions of finishing out. Oh! That one got way out. Watch this. How wide does this one get? It's got to be about the third board. And he trips the two from behind. And he goes, well, I'll take it. You bet you will. How about another one? Leave no doubt about it. We'll watch this one again. Over the third arrow, out to about six or seven. And he sweeps them all off. One more for good measure. And he gets a Brooklyn. He's got all the shots. And no one comes in to congratulate his buddy. It's Hunter Moffat who will be signing the coveted trophy pin today. We'll talk to him next.
Before we wrap things up today, I just want to send out a personal note of thanks to all the people who were kind enough and thoughtful enough to send along their condolences this week, both on YouTube and on our Facebook group. It's been a tough week, and my emotions have been pretty raw. For some of us, losing a four-legged loved one is just as hard as losing one with two legs. But I knew that once I could actually sit down and work on pushing another episode of Prodigy Bowlers Tour out, it would not only serve as something of a distraction for me, but would also restore somewhat of a routine in my life. So while this may have been one of the hardest jobs I've had in a while, it was much needed. Thanks for your kindness and for your indulgence in allowing me to share a few personal moments with you today. And, as you see, we now have another week of Prodigy Bowlers Tour in the books. Even with so many of our A players out at the final Interstate All-Stars Tournament of the season between the Georgia All-Stars and the All-Star teams from North and South Carolina, we still managed what I thought was a pretty interesting show. Oh, and congratulations to the Georgia All-Stars who took the overall on the season this weekend. That's big. But today, in our little corner of the world, it was Hunter Moffat who emerged as the winner on Prodigy Bowlers Tour. And so, he gets to do the honors and sign the coveted trophy pin. There's your runner-up, ladies and gentlemen, Jake Bowling, who bowled great all day long, and then he just ran into a buzzsaw. And you know, they used to say that whenever a professional bowler would have to go up against Dick Weber, it's just they kind of tightened up a little bit. It's kind of like the phenomena of bowling against Hunter Moffat, who just intimidates all of them. What happened there in that last match? I have no idea. But how many wins is this for you this year? Five? So you passed Brandon Caravini. And now you're you're within striking distance almost of Nick. Congratulations. Thank you.